So what are the Evergels? Well, besides being an excuse to fight another boss on your own terms and without any summons or spirits, they appear to be small pocket dimensions built for the sole purpose of imprisoning, presumably for eternity. Now, it's not stated anywhere, but I believe that time doesn't really pass inside the Evergels. Like I said, there's not much evidence to back that, but it would make sense for the whole imprisoning someone for eternity kind of thing. It's ever jail, so, you know. It's not called fucking temporary timeout. It implies that it means to imprison them forever. At least that was my takeaway, that they were built to imprison people for eternity. They appear to be powered or kept intact by these abnormal stone clusters, which sort of look like rock worms or a bit like the Pokemon Onyx if he had one eye one human looking eye. Specifically, this eye glows when there is a prisoner inside the Evergel and is not glowing once the prisoner has been dealt with. There's next to nothing known about these things other than what the wiki keeps trying to force down everybody's throat that they may be connected in some way to the arcane spheres of faces as if that wiki ever helped anybody with anything. I use it to find quotes from NPCs and they even get those wrong. But anyway, moving on. Today we're going to be talking about the ones that ended up residing in these Evergels, and for the most part they just appear to be people in prison for various crimes, or offending certain groups, or just reminding people of the past. There's even a few prisoners from the various wars that have been fought in the lands between. But I think most intriguing out of all of the people, or beings, that wound up inside Evergels are the ones who took to them to hide from something or just the world in general or in at least one unfortunate case, imprison themselves to save said world. But we're going to get into all that and more on today's episode of Honored Madman. The inside of these Evergels looks exactly like the outside of them, except darker. The inhabitants of most of these tend to hide in a little blue aura that emanates from the ground, and they jump out of it when you approach, or they sort of just appear like they're stepping out of the shadows. It's a bit similar to the space orb of sorts that the Onyx and Alabaster Lords occasionally step out of. Notable examples would be at the pockmarked cliffside in the Weeping Peninsula, and uh, one at the Yellow Annex Tunnels, and there's yet another one deep in the lake of rot. But anyway. The interior also features these invisible walls or barriers to keep people from wandering too far from the arena of the Evergel. Now I say they're invisible but they aren't really that invisible. They're sort of like the thing that comes up when you fight any of the people you invade for the Volcano Manors or for Fia's Champions or when you're fighting the Champions of the Great Jar. You can see the barrier, it's not like New Vegas where it's just a straight up invisible barrier that's blocking your path, but anyway. Let's start with the Forlorn Hound Evergel. It is located in Southern Limgrave near the little bridge to the Weaving Peninsula, and it contains one rogue Bloodhound Knight. His name is Darwill, and he may have imprisoned himself inside the Evergel to hide from those who wish him dead. Blythe refers to him as a traitor, so it does seem that their loyalty has limits. Or perhaps that their master was a traitor and that the knight has managed to evade justice after his master got what was coming to him. The Bloodhound Knights themselves are a bit like the Outrider Knights that we saw in Dark Souls 3. They were initially reluctant servants of the Pontiff Sullivan in that game, who would give them these rings that would slowly turn them into animals over time. And their fighting style is more or less the same as the Bloodhounds. They run around on all fours, jump around, swat at you with a sword, or in the Outrider Knights they usually had rapiers so they would poke at you. Unlike the Outrider Knights of Dark Souls 3, we don't actually know who created the Bloodhounds in Elden Ring. All we know is that they're knights who are bred for the sole purpose of being blindly loyal to whoever holds their leash. Sort of like Charon from Fallout 3. Well, until you free him. It's unclear what Bloodhound Knight Darwell did to Rani to warrant Blythe being sent after him. It's safe to say that he likely served her or one of her retainers at some point, and either the retainer went rogue or the knight did. If you happen to talk to Blythe before the fight, you can actually summon him inside the Evergel to help you fight Darwell. But at the end of the day, these guys are just outrider knights who, instead of using straight swords and frost, use curved swords and bleed. This particular Evergel gets a second use through uh, Rani's quest, 
when Blythe is locked in here by E.G. You might be thinking, well, damn, that's fucked, but it's actually for his own good, you see. Blythe is a construct of the two fingers and the greater will given to Ranny to serve her because she was meant to replace Merica. Ranny had no intentions to do this, so she slayed the godly flesh she was born with and went on her own path. And since Blythe was created by the two fingers for Ranny, well, let's just say his programming goes a bit haywire afterwards, after she goes against them. He also drops the Bloodhound Sword, which is the weapon used by all Bloodhound Knights, and it's a super useful weapon to start the game with. I saw everybody using it when the game first came out, and I actively chose not to use it just because I wanted to be cool and different, and uh, don't be like me, it's a super useful weapon. I don't know why I didn't use it early on, besides uh, my stupid reason. Now on to the Stormhill Evergel, which was actually, I believe, the first Evergel I ever encountered. It's located south of the shack where you meet Rodrika. It's right by that little ambush site at the Stormhill Gates. And this particular Evergel houses a Crucible Knight. Now this is the first time I encountered one, but it would not be the last, because you could find these guys just about everywhere. But there's only a finite amount of them. And though they're small in number, They've spread, or rather scattered across the lands between, or underneath the lands between, like the four winds. Some wound up in Landell, the golden capital, while others wound up in the fair Missoula in the sky, where they appear to be hunting the beastmen. More on that later. These guys seem to prefer the underground, as they are found throughout the eternal cities, primarily Nokron and the city without a name that's found underneath Landell. The ones with spears were led by a knight named Saluria, who was found at the husk of the great tree, in deep root depths. And the ones that wielded a great sword were led by Ordovis, who along with one of his men has been entombed deep underneath Ariza Hero Grave, which gives us evidence that, much like famous Frenchman Jean-Pierre Polnareff, our friend Ordovis here is fond of chariots. Now I used to hate going through all of the hero graves, but I don't really mind them anymore now that the chariots are no longer a one-hit kill. But anyway, these knights were followers of Godfrey. They were heroes, legends, badasses, but they were also relics of the past. In fact, they were living embodiments of the previous age, known as the mysterious crucible of life, which was what the Erd Tree was before it became the Erd Tree. Or at least that's my takeaway from it being called the Erd Tree in its primordial form. It would also line up with the Crucible Knight's color scheme being the same color as Primordial Gold and Root Resin. But I guess the real question here is why is one locked up in Stormhill? Well, I gotta admit, this is one where there's like a lot of possibilities, in my opinion at least. Because outside of the ones located in Landell who I can't really seem to place, the others appear to be in opposition to the Golden Order and the Greater Will and the Erd Tree. They were once Godfrey's knights, but after he got banished, they were left without a leader. But I think it's safe to assume that at least some of them harbored enough resentment towards the greater will for what they did to their master, that they would openly rebel. Now this could be a case of that, or it could be something cooler. Maybe that knight showed up in Stormhill to serve Godric because he served his ancestor all those years ago. And maybe he even served him for a little bit until he realized what a pathetic, inbred embarrassment that Godric was to his family name, and either just left his service and Godric got mad and imprisoned him, or he openly defied him and maybe even challenged him to a fight and lost and got imprisoned. But why would Godric spare him? Well, he doesn't got that many people in his corner. He figures maybe if he spares him sometime down the road, he can let him out and he'll serve him again. Or maybe he's saving him for grafting purposes. Or maybe Godric isn't even the one who imprisoned him. Maybe that Crucible Knight's been there a long time. Like all the way back to the days of Godfrey when he was still conquering everything in sight. Perhaps when he and his Crucible Knights were challenging the Storm King's forces, one of them got captured and ended up being an eternal prisoner of war. I think any of those possibilities is likely. Let me know if I missed something on that one though. That's one of the more open-ended entries on this list in my opinion, is the random Crucible Knight in Stormhill. But on defeat he drops Aspect of the Crucible Tail, which is a really cool incantation. I mean, I like all three of the aspects of the Crucible. The horn probably being my favorite, but the breath and the tail are just as useful. And the tail is really fun because it lets you do a double whip if you charge it. 
Out of all three aspects, it's the first one I got, and it took me the longest to master, but it's also the most fun to use. Well, I guess that kind of goes between that and the horns. It depends on the player's preference. Hopefully, in the DLC, they'll give us Aspect of the Crucible wings, so we can go full Ultimate Lifeform cars. That way, I can at least make a funny video using Egyptian dubstep. But anyway, let's move on. Oh yeah, back to the Beastmen getting killed by the Crucible Knight. Well, I think this one has a simple explanation. The Beastmen, whose origins I find vexing to say the least, appear to be the lapdogs of the Golden Order, or the Greater Will in this instance. Yeah, they use Dragon Cult spells and have even hoarded an ancient prayer book to themselves, but I'm guessing that only came about after the Great War with the Dragons. So I'm guessing that a couple of these Crucible Knights got tired of these bootlickers and decided to just go exterminate them along with the ancient dragons with whom they appear to have some sort of weird symbiotic relationship with, or are, at the very least, their servants, which is why the other Crucible Knight is standing over the carcass of a dragon. I used to think he was maybe mourning it, but now I'm pretty sure he killed it. Although, again, I could be wrong about all this. Next up, we've got the Weeping Peninsula Evergill, located far to the south of the map, in the lands once ruled by a guy named Morn. Now, this Evergill houses an ancient hero of Zamor, these lanky, dreadlocked Icemen were essentially the age-old enemies of the Fire Giants. Possibly the only ones actively opposing the Giants before America and Godfrey showed up. Now, why this rivalry came about is really unclear, and it possibly just has to do with one representing Ice and the other representing Fire, but it could have also had something to do with the Ice Dragons which were the original rulers of the mountaintops before the giants came along and kicked them off. There's nothing back in it besides a shared affinity for ice, but possibly the Zamor warriors were allied with the ice dragons before this happened. But anyway, what's not speculation is that when what I like to call the Dawn of the Erd Tree was going on, these dudes quickly threw in their lot with Merica and company and, you know, you know the rest, they pretty much genocided the giants together. But it makes you wonder, what is one doing imprisoned all the way down here, way far from the mountaintops? And also, why does he drop Radagon's sore seal? Well, I don't really know about the sore seal. I mean, I could go into a whole bunch of possible theories on why that is there. But I think an easier question to answer, and there is no straight answers, is why he's there. So, when Godfrey and Merica waged their war on the world, we don't really know which order they did it in. I'm assuming they started from the top because they would conquer the giants. They were their greatest enemies. And then, you know, they came down conquering accordingly. Which would mean when they came down to the Weeping Peninsula to conquer Castle Morn and basically knock off that hero that had rallied all the people down there, they brought some of the heroes or knights of Zimor with them. And one of these unfortunate bastards wound up getting imprisoned during the conflict there. That seems like the most likely possibility to me, at least. Well, either that or they defected from the Golden Army after being, I don't know, inspired by this last worthy foe of Godfrey's, only to get themselves, of course, imprisoned. Next up, we have the Malefactor's Evergill, located in Liernia. This one houses an NPC boss by the name of Adon, Thief of Fire. This guy's reason for being imprisoned is probably the most easy to explain. But it still comes down to two different possibilities on why he's in there. Shit, or maybe more. But first, we need a little bit of context. So, the Fire Monks live in the mountaintops of the Giants. They were tasked with guarding the flame. Eventually, over time, they grew to worship it. And they were charged with keeping secrets. Secrets like uh, the fact that the last Fire Giant was still alive and that the Fell God resided inside him. Someone, either a defector from their own ranks or one of the criminals that's charged with being their servant stole this great secret from the fire monks and fled down south into Lyernia. This person was a Don. Now I say they must have been a defector or one of the servants because, well, they're wearing the armor. Which they could have scavenged from the Guardian's garrison when they stole the thing just as easily, but it seems more than likely that they were some kind of defector from the ranks of the fire monks. He's even wearing the altered version of the Prelate's armor, along with a Fire Monk set, but again, he could have just scavenged this gear from the Fire Monk HQ at the Guardian's garrison, when he pilfered their secret. Anyway, this dude fled down to Liernia, and the Fire Monks cut a burning path through the lands between to get him. 
sacking a fort near Mount Gelmir and setting up shop in Lyrnia and patrolling the swamps. They don't seem to know where Adon is, so they probably aren't the ones who imprisoned him inside the Everjail. That wouldn't really make much sense. They'd probably just take him back to the mountaintops and go execute him. No, I think he either got captured by the Cuckoos, who just imprisoned him because he's a reckless son of a bitch, using fire that he shouldn't have, or he, much like Darwil, could have imprisoned himself to hide from the army of fire monks that were coming after him. If he did choose to go in of his own accord, I don't think he can get out. The Evergel seem to have a one-way lock as we see when we release or don't release Blythe. So it's possible that Adon here chose eternal imprisonment as a viable alternative to being tortured by the fire monks. And when killed, he drops the very reason that he's there in the first place. The flame of the fell god. The secret of the fire monks in incantation form. Next up, we've got the Cuckoos Evergel that houses Bowles, the Carrion Troll Knight. This is another one where it's fairly easy to understand why he's imprisoned. So in the lands between and just about everywhere besides Caria, the trolls are basically treated like omen or misbegotten, filling the role of servants or beasts of burden or even just heavy fighting units. Well, not in Caria. In Caria, they are treated as equals, and they fought side by side with their human counterparts. Well, at one point, Caria ruled the Academy and all of Lyrnia. That would only last so long as the Academy would eventually rebel and the Civil War would ensue between the Cuckoo and the Carrions. So just based on the name of this Evergel, the Cuckoo's Evergel, we can assume that that's why this Carrion Knight is imprisoned here. He is quite simply a prisoner of war, and a pretty valuable one at that, because, I mean, they only have a handful of Carrion Troll Knights, and they are very effective in combat. At least when it comes to dealing with the Cuckoo soldiers. That it happened during the Civil War. He of course drops the giant version of the Glint Blade spell. Which is a sorcery that's unique to the Troll Knights. Even the headless variants at the Four Belfries cast it. Which I found interesting as it implies that they've clung to these carrion beliefs. Even despite being in a weird state in between life and death. But moving on now to the Royal Grave Evergel, which is located just behind Carrion Manor and guarded by a lesser Red Wolf of Radagon alongside his pack of dire wolves. They can be easily snuck around, but I really enjoy fighting those things. Now, it's said that this Evergel was built by the Order of the Carrion Royal Family, and it can be assumed that they used it to house certain undesirables. However, by the time that the player shows up, its occupant is a meteor man. Now the particular meteor man that's inside it has actually changed. It was originally an alabaster lord, and now it's an onyx lord. I forget which patch changed it, or if I'm just having the Mandela effect, but I believe something to that effect happened. For whatever reason though, now it currently houses an onyx lord. Now there's very, very little information when it comes to onyx lords. I've done a video on them and the alabasters, and I didn't really get that much figured out in that video either. They rose to life when a meteor struck the lands between. Was it the same meteor that dinged Faramazula on its way down? We don't really know. But what we do know is that there's some association with the Astel beast because one is found guarding the second Astel that lives inside Yellow Annex tunnels. I think it's safe to say that both races of meteor men have at least some association with the malformed stars. I mean, Star Chasers appear to worship Alabaster Lords, Onyx Lords, Astels, and full-grown Falling Star Beasts all the same. Not saying that proves they're all connected, but they all do have one thing in common, space. Now, it's said that Radon, the famous demigod who learned gravity just to ride his horse and imprison the stars, learned these skills from an Alabaster Lord. And most descriptions about Alabaster Lords have some reference to that. But the Onyx Lords are a bit more of a mystery. They possess the ability to summon a bunch of meteors, similar to Astel, and this propensity for violence and destruction was the sole reason they were referred to as Lords in the first place. With the Alabaster Lords though, we know that not all of them were hostile and at least one of them was a teacher. So perhaps this Onyx Lord was imprisoned to gain the favor of an Alabaster Lord because the Carrion family wanted their own in-house gravity man. Shit, I know Radon learned in Celia and all, but maybe that was part of the deal with the Alabaster Lord he made. You know, imprison my enemy and I'll teach you all you want to know. 
That is, of course, assuming that the Onyx and Alabaster Lords are opposing sides of something. Which I, again, could be very wrong about. But I think it's also possible that the Carrions imprisoned him here just because of how destructive he was and because of how rare he was. They didn't want to kill him, maybe they wanted to study him. Maybe even Celibus wanted to turn him into a puppet, or at least try to. There's actually a lot of possibilities when it comes to this uh, particular prisoner. Stuff that I hadn't even previously considered until now, and now I'm like, oh, well, that actually seems like the more likely of them. But anyway, moving on. Oh yeah, he drops the spell Meteorite, which is pretty fitting, given that he will spam it if you let him. And I believe that you can get the sword that they wield from the non-boss variants. Found in Yellow Annex Tunnel, and actually there's another boss variant in the Sealed Tunnel as well. But on to the next one. Located deep in the Moonlight Plateau, an area accessible only after partaking in Ranny the Bitch is Questline. I'm just kidding, after reading the translation I know now that she's not a bitch and she's actually got some wholesome goals. Probably the best goals out of all the endings. Tucked away in this hidden area is the Ringleader's Evergel that houses Electo, the Black Knife Ringleader. Now this character is actually pretty fucking important when you really think about it. Being the ringleader, it can be assumed that this is the person who directly conspired with Rani and possibly Merica to pull off the Knight of Black Knives. An event that effectively changed the face of the lands between by plunging it into a never-ending conflict of the Children of Gods. Also that Rani could give herself a chance to finally sever the connection between Gods and the lands between. But since Rani's hand in this plot was all but unknown to pretty much everybody in the Carrion royal family, outside of those directly loyal to her, and of course the coolest of all demigods, Rikard, who actively helped her in her plot, this ringleader Electo was promptly hunted down and imprisoned, but not before witnessing their daughter get murdered right in front of them. That's right, Black Knife Electo is actually the mother of everybody's favorite spirit summon, Black Knife Teach. But yeah, since the Carrions didn't know Rani was like the main orchestrator of this plot, and they just thought, wow, someone just murdered one of our princesses, they wanted blood. So they murdered Teach and imprisoned Electo for eternity. But little did the Carrions know that Teach lives on in the form of spirit ashes that you get after defeating her mother at this Evergel. Next up, we've got one that I didn't even know existed until like my second playthrough. I'm of course referring to the Celia Evergel that houses a battle mage named Hughes. So as you could probably tell by his title, Huge is a battle mage. But what is a battle mage? Well, they're originally scholars from the Academy of Rey Lucaria, located in Liernia, who chose to study the Hema or Hyma conspectus, which itself was effectively just magical artillery. And they also studied the gavel, which was just a big old giant magical hammer, which is honestly one of my favorite spells in the game. I wish there was a miracle version of it. Or excuse me, I mean incantation. But nope, this cool hammer, like many things, is restricted to int users only. So as you can probably tell, magical hammers, magical artillery, the Hama school was probably one of the coolest out of all of them. But I think what made the battle mages particularly based is how they looked at the scholars from the other schools. So, for example, when the academy locked its doors, the battle mages, or the scholars of the Hyma Conspectus, were the only ones to venture outside its walls. Because, as they saw it, seclusion was no way to foster discovery. Instead, they thought of it as a cheap means of escape. And because of their wandering, these guys have pretty much ended up just about everywhere. There's some in Kaelid, there's some in Landell, there's some in, well, Altus, not Landell. And there's some even as far as the Halleck Tree. But why is one locked up at the Celia Evergel in Kaelid? Well, the cool thing about this particular prisoner is that we get his spirit ashes after we defeat him. Meaning we gain the ability to summon him, and he's actually somewhat useful. I don't have him upgraded all the way, but I managed to get some pretty cool footage of him fucking people up in Caleb. But that also means that we have an item that has a description that directly describes him. It tells us that he's native to the town of Celia, the Nox-built town that Radon learned his magic at. 
It's also the place where Gowry and Garrus supposedly came from. Two really awful specimens. Garrus for murdering his family in the name of science, and Gowry for basically just being the pawn of some kind of outer god of rot. There's no way that the pests are secretly, like, the best viable option for the lands between. So, that's why I call them awful. Anyway, this Mr. Hughes comes from Celia, and like many people from Celia, he wasn't a good guy. He came to the Ray Lucarian Academy and studied the Hyma Conspectus and eventually became a battle mage. Now, battle mages were of course taught to quell conflict, but Hughes developed a taste for it. And I'm guessing, you know, he returned to Celia and just started causing trouble to the point where they just imprisoned him there for all eternity. There's not much of another possibility I can find. If you guys can think of anything, let me know in the comments, but that's really all I can think of when it comes to huge. Now this brings us to the Evergel that probably houses the most hated boss in the game. Not because he's cheap or poorly designed or just outright annoying or anything. No, it's because he's a direct copy of Godric's first phase, renamed as Godfroy the Grafted. Now, lore-wise, he's probably Godric's ancestor who first partook in grafting. And besides that assumption, there's a little bit more lore to him. It's said that he was defeated by the ancient Dragon Knight Kristoff, a member of the Dragon Cult and famous Lightning Knight of Landell. This act gave him an Erd Tree burial to the point where I guess we get to use him as Spirit Ashes. So unlike a lot of bosses on this list, this guy actually has a definitive reason that we can cite as to why he's in the jail. He just kind of sucks both lore-wise and gameplay-wise, I just don't want to spend too much time talking about him. He's basically just thrown into the game for us to accept that Godfrey's line has been fucked up for a long time. and It didn't just start with Godric, it has been done before, and you know, the whole cycles thing. But again, I do think his actual lore reason for existing is at least to hint that this is the ancestor that Godric got all the grafting from. He obviously didn't learn it from Godfrey or Godwin, although Godfrey did have a lion grafted to his back. Anyway, moving on. Ah yes, we're at one of my favorite ones, the Lord's Contender Evergill, that houses one festering knight, Vike, or Lord Contender Vike, whatever you want to call him. Now, out of all the named tarnish in the game, I think this guy might be hands down the most badass. At least until the player comes stomping around, swinging a club, killing everything in sight while wearing a speedo. So Vike was the one tarnished who came the closest to becoming Elden Lord. But he might have had a slight advantage over the rest of them. You see, before Godfrey and his tarnish were banished from the lands between, Vike was actually a knight of Landell. In fact, he was said to be the favored knight of Lanisax, who took on the form of a human woman to lead the dragon cult of Landell, possibly confirming that much like one of Priscilla's parents from Dark Souls 1, Vike was a dragon fucker. But anyway, even that wasn't enough to keep him from being banished and he was kicked out just like the rest of us. But when he came back, he saw a shattered land. Like many tarnished, Vike had a maiden and when he learned that he would have to sacrifice her to sort of burn the Erd tree to fulfill the prophecy and all that, he couldn't bring himself to do it, so he would seek alternative means to burn this eldritch monstrosity. But unfortunately for him, this would be nothing but a road to ruin. He would eventually be tricked by the demon of the frenzied flame, Shabriri, to venture deep underneath the Landell sewers and meet with the Three Fingers. There he inherited the Flame of Frenzy. Now we don't know exactly what happened when he returned to his maiden and told her of this, it's possible she just offed herself, and it's also possible that she was killed in some other way. Maybe even Shabriri murdered her, although I don't see what he'd have to gain from that. Another possibility would be Vike killing her. We don't really know, but we do know that she's dead, and that Vike would resign himself to defending her corpse in the form of invading anyone who dared approach the Chapel of Inhibition, located beyond the Frenzied Flame Village. It's also possible that he's the fucking cause for all that frenzy over there, too. 
Because we know that he returned with the Flame of Frenzy at some point and had to have, you know, taken the steps through the village and back up to the church, which very well could have turned several of the inhabitants of the village into frenzied madmen. Although, of course, this is just as likely not the case. It's not really known why he continued beyond this point, but it's possible that he gained some kind of motivation to burn the world from all of his sorrows at what happened to his maiden. Although I like to think that he realized that he's better than doing the bidding of some demon and decided to pursue on for his own reasons. We don't know how he got past Morgoth, but maybe while Morgoth was away invading people as Margit, he slipped past him because, you know, Margit's still alive or Morgoth's still alive when we show up. So it's unlikely that Vite killed him, but Vite could have also just defeated him while not outright killing him, leaving him behind for us to collect his great rune as Vike himself no longer had any desire to collect them. From that point, he presumably made his way to the Lord Contender Evergel and sealed himself inside it. Although I do suppose that it's possible he was imprisoned there by some other means. For example, when you fight him inside the Evergel, he doesn't use any of his frenzied flame abilities like he does when he invades you. He instead only uses the dragon and red lightning abilities. This could mean that the frenzied flame was taken from him by Shabriri after he would no longer do his bidding, and he was instead locked inside this Evergel as punishment since no one can really be actually killed without the Rune of Death. But I can't say for certain how this impressive individual wound up in this fucked off Evergel on the edge of the world. I think it comes down to either of those possible outcomes. Either he imprisoned himself or he was imprisoned there by Shabriri. When you fight him as an invading phantom, he drops a finger remedy, a fingerprint grape, which is for Hyetta's quest, and Vike's war spear, a very infamous weapon when it comes to PvP. And when you eliminate him here at the Evergel, you get his set and his unique incantation, Vike's Thunderbolt, which allows you to enchant your whole body with red dragon lightning, showing us just how fond those dragons were of our festering fingerprint friend here. But now we are on to the final Evergel. I'm of course referring to the only way to get into the Hallig Tree. The Ordina Evergel. Now this one is completely different than the rest in that it appears to be designed to be a puzzle of sorts to act as the sole entrance fee of the Hallig Tree. It's no fucking wonder why the place has remained so hidden for so long. But not hidden enough to stop Mog from kidnapping Mikola, which I will be making a video about soon. Mikola, not Mog. I feel like he's played out. Anyway, this particular Evergel houses four Black Knife Assassins. All non-respawning, of course. You can kill them off pretty easily if you use the Sentry Torch. Which was, of course, developed by Morgoth, the grace given after the Night of Black Knives as a sort of response to the tragic event in hopes that it would never ever happen again as the torch contained the ability to dispel the cloaking effect used by the black knife assassins the jail also houses a bunch of albinoric wolfback archers just without the wolf although we do see the spirit of a wolf on the outside but these female first generation albinorics are no joke and they can quickly fill you full of more arrows than you can count so you kinda gotta play this shit smart but Pretty much everybody watching has already done this a million times, so I'm not going to explain how to get past all of it. There's no point to it. But the purpose of this Evergel, or at least the puzzle itself, is to light these four flames. And they're all at these various towers throughout the town of Ordina, or rather its Evergel pocket dimension counterpart. Now, I've already mentioned it somewhere else before, but I think it's interesting that Ordina has the exact same design as Celia. And I know that these games reuse assets a lot, but lore-wise, this could mean that Ordina was also built by the Nox. I don't know, it just felt worth mentioning. I don't think they made the Evergel or this puzzle, though. That seems clearly devised by Mikola. The occupants being in there, at least the Albinorix, I think are there voluntarily. The Black Knife Assassins might be there as a sort of punishment for them to act as the danger of the puzzle alongside the Albinorix to sort of deter anybody with ill intent. I don't think Mikola forgave the Black Knife Assassins or anything though. I mean the guy was actively trying to undo what they did with his work on the Eclipse and Castle Soul and all of that. 
it's just interesting that he would use such a dangerous puzzle as the uh, price of entry for the Hallig tree. I mean, you also have to get through the branches of his Hallig tree, which is filled with scarlet rotted ants and a damn platoon of oracle envoys led by two fucking big ass ones. But yeah, there's not much of a reward when it comes to completing this Evergill outside of access to the Hallig tree. And of course, there's a black knife assassin set outside under the stairs that lead to the teleporter. But other than that, there's not much more here. And with that, I believe I've covered all of the Evergills. Now in the comments, let me know if there's anything I missed or got wrong or anything like that. Or any differing opinions or anything you'd like to add to the overall discussion. Please share them. As always, if you liked the video, please like it. And if you didn't like it, please dislike it. And if you like hearing me talk on and on and on, please consider subscribing. My next video should definitively be on the two dragon cults. Then I have one on Rani and her plot, as well as my upcoming Black Noir video. And honestly, a lot more. I just, there's too many to name, and it gets annoying after a while, I imagine. Just hearing projects being named off. But if you guys made it through the whole video, I appreciate you, and I will see you next time. Let's take one last, uh, rip. And be out.